Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the CPL Newsroom Podcast. Christian Jack alongside my team and cast of characters. And boy, oh boy, this should be a fun show. It is the CPL Newsroom Podcast After Dark. That's right. <laughs> Closing in on midnight Eastern. Uh, Marty says before we type the show that he almost fell asleep. Well, he has an hour on us, so I, he better <laughs> stay awake before the three of us. Uh, no Brady today. I gave him the night off quite well. The reason being, it's already 1 a.m. where he is. So. It's the next day. It's already the next it's day. Already the next day. This podcast we, would be old. That's right. And we get it. You're listening to this on a Friday anyway. So that's effectively <laughs> means that Brady's already on Saturday when you're listening to this. So wherever you are. Uh, uh, but we are here to recap the three matches this week, midweek. Uh, that just happened. The big one, Cavalry against Forge. And uh, yeah, my boys are here. You heard them here. And uh, boys, uh, how's things going? I wanted to usually start off with... Uh, a question. So let's do that again. I suppose in the spirit of the one game this week where all three goals were scored by headers, that's right, on your head, son, three goals, the York game and three goals on your head. What is your favorite hat to wear? We all own hats. What's your favorite hat? Benedict Rhodes. I'm not much of a hat wearer, to be honest, but uh, I'll keep it Canadian. I'll go for a toque in the winters. Can never go wrong with one of those. Can never go wrong with one of those. Uh, what about you, Marty Thompson? I have a lot of hats, so this is a tough decision. <laughs> Same, mate. Uh, London Majors baseball team. Wow. Oh. Wow. Amazing. This is why this this is why this question works so well, because we could just go anywhere. <laughs> I, I love it. Uh, Charlie O'Connor Clark, what about you? I like a hat that you can look kind of silly in, I think. Maybe a big floppy sun hat. I know Marty has a good one of those at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> a kickoff branded. Yes, CPL branded. They, nice. It covers it covers your shoulders. Uh, real Marty wide. needs the sun hat because he and I talked today. He's a tons of sun. Meanwhile, where we are uh, here in Ontario, uh, it's just raining all the time. So yeah. Marty's in Winnipeg laughing at us as we're uh, trying to put out all these leaks. Anyway, let's get <laughs> on to it. Uh, the first game of the, the weekend, we recap, uh, we start with the game that just literally finished about an hour ago. A cavalry nil, Forge 2. Charlie, you are a correspondent on this one. Uh, I know it's been tough to come off the game right away, and you had all the energy in this. So let's peak early, my friend, and then you can rest over the three <laughs> games. Uh, what was the overall observations of this one? We'll get into Becker in a second, but how did Forge do this collectively? Yeah, this was, I think, a very professional one from Forge because we kind of had a tale of two halves here where the first half was very wide open and both teams were kind of running at each other back and forth. You know, Forge scored both of their goals with pace moving forward. And then in the second half, they're up two goals. They shut it down completely, right? They, they're they able to sit back in that kind of block, that, that sort of four-man back line, just not really moving. And they just, they just hold Cavalry off. They're fine with letting them have the ball. They're fine with letting them just dance around the outside, even if it's down, down to the corners by their box. But Cavalry had 75% of the ball in the second half and two shots on target. Wow. Right? Which is... I mean, it's, it's kind of a trademark thing for Forge to be able to play the game on their terms. And it's kind of why they're the champions twice in a row is they don't really let teams, you know, tell them how to play a game, right? So if, if Forge tells you that, all right, this game is completely slowing down, that's what's going to happen. Mm. And I think Bobby Smirniotis literally just now explained it. They had a short bench in this game, only five outfield players. They're missing, I think he said seven players, including Tristan Borges, including Daniel Cripson, you know, Maxim Tissot as well, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, part of that is also just about preserving energy. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you go up two goals in that very fast-paced first half and you're able to slow it down a little bit and keep some in the tank, I think he said they're coming up on four games in 10 days or something like that, then you you take that every day. And, and it's really just a, a professional way to see out a match from Forge. We will get into some more individual honors. Uh, I'm sure we're going to talk about Marco Bustos later. and Michael Petrasso was very good as well, but we have to carry on without burying the lead about Kyle Becker. What a week it's been. We all sung his praises before. Uh, Marty and Ben, I'll get your take on this in a second. But Charlie, the goals were exceptional strikes, both of them, and at crucial mm-hmm. moments in the game as well, no? Yeah, they really were. I mean, for Forge to come out just 13 minutes in and, and put one on the board immediately, you know, after it took them a little while against Pacific to start scoring, they didn't score in the first two games. They come out really quickly this time, and Becker's just in perfect position. I think that was one of the best first halves I've actually seen Kyle Becker play for this club, maybe, which is, I mean, he's played a lot of really good halves, but 
the the movement for him leading up to both of those goals, I think uh, leading up to, to that first goal, you watch him kind of track Joe DiChiara heading into the box and then he sort of makes a little cut to the left just enough to get him to bite and start drifting off to that same side as well. And then Becker just runs right into the box the other direction and he's in acres of space for that, that little volley home, which is a great finish. And then the second one was kind of the same thing. He reads the play. He's in so much space. I mean, Cavalry, what are you doing? Just not marking him there. But he finds the space and he punishes it immediately, right? Apologies for the phone there. It was either Brady wanting to really come on at 1 a.m. or Marty just ordering some room service. I don't know which. Yeah, it must have been a hotel. I think I have a package downstairs, I think. I didn't pick it up today because I've been at the stadium. Like, there you go. That's okay. <laughs> as long as you're not just solely confined to your suite <laughs> and you're, you're actually allowed out of the suite to go get your package, that's the uh, <laughs> that's the most important thing. Uh, Marty, you were there. Obviously, again, seeing these games in action is a special, pretty um, different kind of look that you can have on it. It just feels right, does it not, that Becker can carry this team in these moments? You know, again, he's not, he's not many players who played all 90 minutes in all four. He's done it. And by the way, he could go play another 90 minutes right now if he was asked, is that fit? Well, and you, Charlie, you touched on it, though. Like, after the first goal in the stadium, you know, I remember like looking around and thinking, Calvary can still come back from this. Like, you know, it, it, it wasn't a reach. And then after that second goal, it's like, this is just Forge being Forge. Like there, there was no stopping a player like Kyle Becker from leading this team moving forward into into the result. Like there's absolutely no question. Yeah, I mean, I I I really want to highlight Elamane Cisse. I, I'm sure we're gonna talk talk yeah. about him, but he, he was but he was classed, incredible. Huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, a player that just has been as Bobby uh, as as I said with uh, talk with Bobby after the game. Like this is a player that's been doing this for three years with this team and has played it like almost every position outfield in this or over three years. And yep. like, it's just, it just keeps happening. He's just been incredible. And when, when they really needed it, frankly, right. Without Borges, you know, and, and, and without those pieces. Right. Yeah, no doubt. Great point. Jonsson was ter- terrific again, uh, you know, in there as yeah. well. Um, Benedict, it seems like he, it, not that long ago. And I know this is what professional sports is. It's like, okay, forge. Oh, and two, no goals. What are we going to, here we are. Steamrolling, beat Pacific 3 0 <laughs> and Cavalry. You know, not just by the way, just not any teams, Pacific and Cavalry, mm-hmm. and quite comfortable in the end scoreline and performances. This is uh, this has been a statement week for, for, for against Pacific and Cavalry for this Forge team, Ben. Yeah, I think they went from like, will they make the playoffs to will they repeat as champions for the third time in a matter of days, right? Like, <laughs> and it's just it's the Forge no, way of doing uh, things as well. Like, they they just they beat teams they need to beat, and, and they did that twice this week. That, that's that's I never I was never worried about Forge. No. Come on, and no. for and for like as much as Forge was like emotional, you know, here in the bubble, like you know, after that loss, we talked about how they took the the, the lost Edmonton specifically. But talking to a couple of players even after the game, you know, it was like that was that was. I was always in reach. They knew that that was always going to happen. You just have to always trust the process. Bobby's always going to do what Bobby does. And these players have been doing this for so long. It's just like, you know, they knew the results were going to come. Just they, relax. They did. And I think we all did relax, but, you know, we root for stories, you know, yes. and then the fact that <laughs> no, they were no, down, no, that, that fact they were down 0-2 was, it was, 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 I think, really good. And then I'll play on the other side. The fact that now they're not, and the fact that they are reaching these heights, this league is better with Giants. This league is better with teams striving to get forward. This team has made this league better. Cavalry and Pacific walked off the pitch today, uh, Charlie. Pacific last week, Cavalry today going, them again. We got to get yeah. to, we got to beat these guys eventually. And I know Tommy Wilden, we asked him after the game, was like, look, you know, you know, some players today, Camargo could have played. Escalante may not have got taken off at half time if it's the Island games. They're not showing their best. And Pacific made five changes and didn't show their best either. So I'm not just saying it, you know, that, that those guys have got the best beaten to them. But they, you know, they are looking at Forge going, we still need to prove that we can beat these boys. Yeah. I, I mean, Bobby Smirniotis will tell you that if, if you say, is, is this Forge Calvary thing a rivalry? He'll say, no, not really, because we kind of haven't lost to them much since right. that Canadian championship tie. And then Tommy Wheel Jr. basically said the same thing. He said, look, I, I don't know if, if you can, you can say the teams have a bogey player, right? He he said that Kyle Becker has, has really done a, done a number on them in recent games that they've played. And he said, if they can't sort that out, then it's going to become a recurring theme. Right. And I right. mean, I think, I think really forge getting back to their heights and being forge again is, is good in the sense that, 
you know, other teams have have that standard again that they're looking to to hit, and Forge have set the standard, so it's 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 still where it's always been, and and it's still you know for other teams to to surpass or meet it. Yeah, one hundred percent, completely agree with you, Benedict. You had a tweet out there, pretty symbolic night. One hundred and fifty Canadian Premier League games tonight. Forge, who were involved in one fifty tonight, were also involved in one hundred. We're also involved in number fifty and number one, and so again, fittingly <laughs> that they delivered again in all four, Ben. Yeah, and I think they're also involved in 75 and 125 as well. Um, <laughs> just, but not just for, 25, uh, right? Not, no. not 25, no. Wow. Have, they played, have they played every game in this league? <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it's sometimes. Only in the nightmare of their opponents. <laughs> interesting stuff okay cavalry then before we wrap up and we move on to the other games that charlie's going to try really hard to remember after <laughs> covering these games really a lot and i know it's not easy stay with me eleven thirty one eastern time at time of recording uh cavalry charlie um tommy mm-hmm. didn't necessarily have any room to panic nick ledgewood was asked no. by someone else is it time to panic i don't think it, even if there was a panic button right there he wouldn't touch it and it certainly wasn't uh you know there's no reason to panic at all you know again this is just making storylines out of back to back to back to you know results that didn't necessarily go their way um positives for them and maybe areas of concern that you came out of this one yeah there i definitely no reason to panic i mean you know they got beaten by by two really good goals and and then the game shut down but you know cavalry certainly will be a little bit disappointed with the fact that they weren't able to maybe threaten as much as they'd like to with the ball that much they maybe didn't have as much creativity especially through the middle as they might like to have sometimes you know Sergio Camargo's not on the pitch tonight as as we've mentioned and there's there's other help coming down the stretch as well but I, I don't think it's it's not necessarily that they played poorly tonight, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, no. If anything, this was better than than their last game, I think. Uh, and and really, really, a lot of a lot of what you see with Cavalry is is kind of what they have been looking for. Is is you see these these midfield players, you know, Elliot Simmons, I think was was really good again tonight mm-hmm. in recycling the ball, and you know he was very very comfortable in dropping between the center backs and and starting off these these little plays out of the back um maybe you look for them to play with a little bit more of the bite that they showed in the first couple of games you know i think mo farsi had a a bit of a slower night tonight didn't really have as much space jose escalante couldn't quite get into the game as much as as much as he normally likes to uh, anthony novak was marked very very well by his former defenders and and just really couldn't get as many touches of the ball as he wanted uh, but yeah, I think always when, when Cavalry's played Forge, it's been a little bit frustrating for them. And I think they might need to, they're probably looking at it right now and thinking, you know, how, how do we maybe throw something different at this team? Because they have played each other more than any other two CPL teams have. Right. And Forge has had the upper hand so many times and it feels like maybe Cavalry is going to, is going to want to, to throw something completely different next time when they meet, I think like two more weeks from now. Talking about throwing things completely different, um, Tommy Weldon Jr. after the game said, quote, we want answers coming out of the bubble. That's what he basically is working towards. And let me throw this to our own very bubble boy himself, Marty Compton. (laughs) Talk to us, mate, a little bit about the grind in the bubble. And I ask you that because we're seeing right now, we're looking for a bit of flow from teams. And I think the lack of flow is a lot of reasons down to the mental fatigue within the bubble and rotation. And I think through four games, we all expected that. And I think maybe some of us, I don't want to speak for you boys, but maybe you can jump in here, but through maybe fifth game, sixth game, we might start to see a little bit more lack of changes and a little bit more rhythm. But I'm starting to wonder whether that's going to be the case at all. Tommy said it today. We want answers out of it. Maybe this rotation policy of with the games coming thick and fast and the mental fatigue inside that bubble that you can talk to means that we're going to see a lot of this throughout this time you when you're in Winnipeg. And and this is, you know, this is coming up on what was <laughs> I don't even know. I've been in the bubble for so long. <laughs> two two weeks-ish kind of come into that. You know, we get it like you, you mentioned kind of or two and a half, three weeks, something like that. Yeah. Anyways, with the amount of games, right? It 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 does it does it does wear on you just you know because it's 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 just becoming a routine that you need to get used to right it's like it's like anything and what perhaps i'm seeing the most out of the teams is that 
you know, when you get to this point and let's say, like you mentioned, the, this, the rotations there and you know, trying to get answers out of the bubble. Like I think in reality now teams are starting to shift now focusing towards post bubble right. because they've realized now that uh, forge is a great example. Somehow forge, underdogs <laughs> in the first couple weeks right because they've had set like again they've they, they're down seven players and they only had you know what two uh, two three weeks something like that of, of preseason right and like you get through this first sort of hurdle and now you're starting to realize okay well you know christian you brought it up is it even possible to have continuity when you're playing this many games in this right. in this you know and is, is it even possible to hit your peak which i think frankly is 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 not right now but right. You know, that, that's not to say you can't build towards it. Yeah, really good points. Let's move on to the second game of the week. And we're going backwards again. York United get their first victory of the week, of the week, of the of the season. Two goals to one over Valor. Valor's winning streak is over. Um, I suppose the way York were playing coming into this game, they certainly deserve to start winning. Maybe some would say the way Valor are playing, maybe they probably weren't going to keep winning, just the way the nature of the sports. Benedict, you, you did a great report on this and analysis as well. You're our correspondent on this. Your overall takeaways from this match? I think the main takeaway from this match was just how good the York United youngsters were. I mentioned it in the, in the match analysis, and they're already over 1,500 minutes. They're already over the requirement. Yeah. Just, and they've, all, they've also deserved it. Like Every single player who's, who's played deserves to be on the field as well. Um, we've, seen, we've seen, especially throughout the attack level, right? Uh, Max Ferrari, is especially, uh, they've all just been really good, and, and they they bossed that game to it. They did. They definitely did block, boss the game. You know, there's no doubt about it. And they led, led a lot of shots. They also became the first team of the season to win a game from going from behind. What does that tell you a little bit about those young players as well, Ben? That the fact that they went behind from a set piece again, Andrew Jean Baptiste, who has been involved in the Gatorade Team of the Week twice and was Player of the Week last week with a header. Uh, and then York started to really settle into the game. Not easy to do when you're behind off them, Benedict. Yeah, I think uh, Jimmy Brennan after the game kind of talked about how the sort of desire of this team, the hunger to sort of take advantage of this opportunity they have in front of them. And uh, you, that, I think that was pretty evident for, for the during that game. And also I think the fact that the goal was early probably helped them a little bit as well because it sort of gave them the mindset that there's 85 minutes left to get back into this one. Good point. And uh, so slowly but surely they sort of chipped away at it and, and came out deserved winners. Benedict, in your analysis, you singled out Tariq Mohammed, Lowell Wright, Max Ferrari, Cedric Toussaint, Isaiah Johnston as all players who played a lot of minutes. IJ Halley came on as well. If I was to t ask you, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, to single out one of them out of those five youngsters and they all deserve praise, who really caught your eye? Uh, I think it was Lowell Wright. He, he's been sort of knocking at the door the first few games and finally got his first goal of the season. He's still just 17 and he already looks like he looks like he could be a really good striker in this league already. And can still be eligible for these under twenty one minutes for another three four years. So, um, <laughs> the, the more minutes he gets, and the more he sort of easy um, sort of gets more comfortable, I guess, in the York United system, I think the the better he's going to get. And that's kind of a scary prospect for other teams, I think. I would be shocked if he's still in this league in four years. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would be shocked as well. Uh, Marty, that is a thumping of thumping of a header, though. I mean, I know it's a delicious ball in as well by Abzi, who played a big part again. Uh, but what a beautiful header. And we, and, and we got to talk about the fans, too. Uh, oh, yeah. Very we'll briefly. That. Don't yeah. worry. No, no, I mean, uh, just... the reactions to the players. Go for <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. No, no. That was, oh, man. I just, I have my notes. Lowell, with that goal, immediately turns to Red River Rising. And like immediately <laughs> runs to them, and then like he kind of hesitated. The other guy's like, "No, no, no, let's let's give them some some stick." No, right, right. like, yeah, exactly. And that kind of just shows that like how you know I think Jamie Brennan it was Jamie Brennan's quote that said he's really growing into his frame, which is maybe selling up a little bit short about how he how he plays, right? And and you can you, you know he, he, considering his age, where he talked about it, I don't know. Yeah, it was just a great game. I think the players have missed the fans in the stands for lots of reasons. Yeah. Not, that yeah. might be one of them. We can finally end this nonsense about players shushing media members as well. Uh, they, <laughs> they keep going backwards and forth. Hello, one soccer, my mate Gareth. I was having a bit of a tough time with this. <laughs> so maybe the fans can take over the villain uh, of the piece a little bit here. Uh, but overall, a really impressive York United performance. For Valor, I suppose it has to start, Benedict, the talking point with the big moment in the second half. For those who didn't see it, it's 2-1. They're getting back in the game. Free kick comes in. Um, our boy Gallardo, pretty special strike. Uh, can't remember who credit the David Luiz comparison. Charlie, was that you? Somebody had a David <laughs> Luiz tweet about it. Ollie. Ollie, I okay. might have been Ollie, yeah. Yeah, Ollie maybe that. it was Ollie. Somebody knew it was somebody. Uh, then 
puts in the net and then the whistle blows and everybody's wondering why <laughs> apparently Andrew Jean-Baptiste was, was a judge to be too close to the wall. Uh, your overall thoughts on this one, Benedict, how did you write it? How did you cover it? And how did they talk about it after the game? Yeah, I think that might have been the longest paragraph I had to write in terms of like duration. I was, I was Googling the rule, trying to figure out like what was actually going on there. I, um, I still still don't really know what happened there, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, the John Baptiste was too close to the wall. We saw the same thing happen earlier in, in the Denmark and England game earlier in the day, but that one was allowed to count. Um, not, not that it mattered in the end, just to... Let that <laughs> um, it's coming um, out, mate. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but yeah, I think it was an interesting situation. I don't think anyone on the field really knew what was happening except for York United. You saw the right. entire... Entire wall pointing and yelling at the referee. Jimmy Brennan and, and Paul Stalteri on the sideline were yelling, yeah. um, but I don't think I don't think Valor knew the rule and and John Baptiste was so so punished for it. I guess. Yeah, and and down that I can I can verify that that you could they they were screaming that whole time about where he was and that's why you know it was called back initially too, and, yes. it, and it's too bad for the crowd they really wanted some to cheer for and that was a perfect opportunity. Yeah, I'll just end this. My take was it definitely didn't look like that he was illegally placed. I don't think he was that close. Uh, uh, but no. I'm also in for massive controversy. In the moment that Nico starts rolling the ball out and is the first person <laughs> to understand, the play starts developing. And tries, yeah. and, and like, I just want the ref to go, carry on. That would have been absolute manic. Can you imagine yeah. if the guy, you know, suddenly the team turns around and they're all running back to try and defend? I would have been all in for that craziness. Uh, final word on York. Benedict, turn to you. This is a team, as uh, Charlie has already put the minutes up, so please go to our website, campl.ca, already over 1,500 minutes. Um, they have benefited really well from the young players. They win their first game. They look really good. They've only lost one game so far. They play Pacific really tightly. They're good from set pieces. They've still got players to come in. Uh, don't look now, but this is becoming one of the bigger storylines. Is it not inside the bubble? Yeah, definitely. I think they, not only are they sort of racking up those minutes and, and getting these young players opportunities, but they're running with the opportunities and they look like they could be sort of in a uh, contention for a playoff spot. I think if they keep performing the way they are, they're, they're definitely holding their own. And I think that's definitely something to watch the rest of this season. Yeah, no doubt about it. As for Valor, I suppose three wins out of four, they would have taken that in the first place. It was interesting that they played Silva and it became a bit of a hot topic in the post-match press conference because he obviously made the mistake, Marty. Although, again, back to our to uh, our trending topic on this podcast, mental fatigue, rewarding people inside a bubble. That was Rob Gale's answer right away to say, look, you know, but it's not like there's an enormous discrepancy in his mind between Siwar and Silver as well. It's not like, for example, a Tristan Henry situation where I think we'd be really surprised if he isn't, if he's taken out of one of these games in the bubble. They wanted to give Silver an opportunity. Okay, he didn't have a great game, but that you could understand the reasoning after what Gale said in the post-match presser. They they like him as a goalkeeper, right? That's why they brought him back after you know he didn't even play at the Island Games, obviously, because because there's only seven games uh, for them. No, they 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 like him, and you're, you're bang on with the, with the mental fatigue. Everyone deserves a break, and yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, that was that was an unfortunate mistake, but uh, and and I, I guess unfortunately a, a strange goal to concede, but yeah, I mean, I guess difficult. It was nice he wore number zero. I know Charlie was was pretty pumped about that. You, you don't you don't you don't you, you like don't zero Charlie. More than Benedict does. No, Benedict, <laughs> I'm in with you, mate. No zeros. <laughs> it, it, no. no, Marcus Stroman wears zero, right? A picture, like because it's like it's, he's the Stro well, show or something. He thinks it's an O or something. Like, yeah, if, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna start on Marcus Stroman. You can't. But, uh... I'm all in. I mean, it's 11:45. We talk about whatever we want here. But you know, what I'll say this: like, you know, if Matt Silver had like an O in his name, like. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, go for it, mate. But this number zero is a bit. You need to get a clean sheet with number zero. I think it's that's better than you do need that. It's, it's better than the point. it's better than the ninety nine he's listed as an opta here that I'm looking at. I know. I saw. I was about to say he was listed as ninety nine, and you know you can't be. You got to be great if you're number ninety nine. Yeah. <laughs> so, just, uh, yeah. So uh, zero, not having zero at all. Even if you're Strowman, not having him either. Uh, but Benedict, let me ask you this for the. Overall, coming out of this with Valor, with fans, what did it feel like? You know, I know, I know Marty will get to you on this as well, but it's just to have fans back in the stadium, the, 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 entire, the entire optics of the match felt different. Um, you know, I know Valor players were asked about it after the game, and Tamara said it just felt, you know, it just felt like this is what we're about. You know, overall, how did it feel to cover a game like that with fans in the stands? 
Yeah, it was awesome. I think it's been 600 and something days since the last time we got to do that in the CPL. Um, and obviously, we've been waiting a long time for this moment. It's kind of maybe a sign of, of better things to come in the future. Hopefully, we're going to get back to pack, uh, pack stadiums in the hopefully near future. Um, so it, it definitely sort of seems as a sort of step in the right direction, I guess. And Marty, what was it like to see other humans? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was bizarre. You, you 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 touched on it perfectly there, Christian. It just changed the scope of the game. Like you know, when we uh, walking out of the tunnel there with about 15 minutes before kickoff, it 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 something shifted, and it, it felt it felt it felt like yeah, you're you're playing for something different. And then also we should note, like, in, and this was maybe more evident in the stadium, the intensity of that game from the get go was just something different we haven't seen in the bubble so far. Just right from the get go, right, the the crowd was into it the entire game. Red River Rising was was fantastic. Like it it all just fed into itself, and it's it's so strange to say that, but that's how that works. You just haven't seen it for that long. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like it's more of just a reminder, if anything. Charlie, it's just a special day, is it not, for Canadian soccer? Because, you know, yeah. we know other teams yeah. and other leagues haven't got where we have yet. Yeah, it, it was really, really amazing. And I think, you know, it, it's it's amazing to get to this point after obviously how difficult it's been for, you know, I don't even know how long it's been, 30 years or whatever, since we last <laughs> had them. And I mean, after all the, like, how difficult it was for, for the CPL, you know, just to have any season last year and, and to start it this way this year again, to start to see, you know, why it's so important to to keep the league alive, right? Mm-hmm. See, you know, what it's all about. And I think all the players, all the coaches we've asked about it will tell you. I mean, that's that's a huge part of what this is about is, you know, there's these kids in the stands watching these players and, you know, they'll you'll, you'll see a, a kid in the stands wearing an, an Andrew Jean-Baptiste jersey. And it's awesome. That's what it's about. That's what it's all about, right? And it's just, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's an emotional moment. And, and I think it's... I mean, of course, York's going to spoil the party. But, <laughs> but you still, yeah, have, they awesome. still have that moment, do they not, Marty? You know, that yeah. moment when five minutes in, it just felt fitting that they got that goal and could run over there with them. And then John Baptiste kissing to the crowd. It was, it was, that was beautiful. I was, I just, that was, I just felt for the fans that, that mm-hmm. I'm sure there was one who went to the toilet or get up <laughs> during the morning. Just like, oh, I missed the first five minutes, you know? I'm sure there was a couple. <laughs> You know, that, that, that uh, wouldn't be necessary. How was the game? How was the celebration for the goal? Missed it. I was in line for beer. No, there were, were a lot of people just like, yeah, there were a lot of people just taking like selfie videos because I think they were in the same boat. They're well, like, yeah. I'm at an event. And it's like, I got, that, I got that. to leave my house. <laughs> no, honestly, no. I mean, that, and you're sort of like, you see that for a second. You're like, right, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Surreal, surreal experience. One small experience. step. Felt like going back to the moon a little bit, you know. Different. Yeah. All, all over. Uh, let's finish with York United because they were, as, as Charlie alluded to, the party poopers. They do get their win. Quick word on Dominic Zator, Ben, because he was uh, culpable for Andrew John Baptiste's aforementioned goal, where he lost him at the set piece. Jimmy Brennan said it. They 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 acknowledged it. What I love about players like that, though, is the ability to come through failure and rise above it. And after that, he was just a man on a mission. Hardly anything came into the box, and you could see what a top-level defender he was and what a great acquisition for them. And I think he, he was your man of the match as well, Benedict. Yeah, he was. I think that, that was exactly the reason why I think York United signed him. They needed a bit more so solidity at the back. And uh, he said after, after he let that goal in, or sort of culpable for the goal, as you said, he... He just sort of turned it up to another level, and uh, just everything coming into the box, he just headed it away. Everything on the ground, he stepped in front of it. Obviously, scoring the late goal, um, or not late goal, I guess the second half goal. Yep. Um, obviously important, the winning goal, and and this is, this is Jimmy Brennan sort of said after the game, like after, as soon as that goal went in from Andrew Jean Baptiste, the tour just kind of stepped up and and sort of um, can't think of the word for it, like. Um, galvanize the team really. yeah exactly mm-hmm. yeah 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 and what i mean what a leader for that you know, we, i mean we're going to keep talking about this young team all along but you still need players above that like to, to lead them and guide them you know and um you know i think Toussaint was terrific in midfield there's a lot of big heroes on the night but as it's all uh rightly your man of the match benedict terrific job and you again reminder you can read charlie's analysis of the game tonight cavalry against forge or tomorrow or whenever you listen to it and you <laughs> if you're brady maybe a 24 hours ahead um york valor uh, Benedict's uh, great analysis on the sights and sounds as well is all on the website canpl.ca. Final game to recap was the first game of the match day this week. Uh, Pacific FC 1, Atletico Ottawa 0. Sound pretty close. 
If you didn't see it, it wasn't. <laughs> it was a outstanding no. performance by Palmer Ducar's team. In fact, Par told me after the game, one of the best performances the club has had and equally one of the best performances since he's been in charge. They were that good. Um, I wrote about it, a ton of it. I thought him and uh, you know, I thought Bustos and Chung down that right, as good as a pump combination we've seen in any game this season. They were that good. Uh, absolutely fantastic, by the way. Um, and they really had no answer for them. We'll get to Ottawa in a minute and the challenges that they've got. Uh, but you boys, what did you think of this, Marty, in terms of Pacific coming out of the game knowing, and Bustos talks about this as well, they didn't play to their standards against Forge, but they didn't want to go on a slide and they want to continue to get to another level. And this was, I think, despite how, play, how well they played in the first game, I think this was probably their best performance. Yeah, I think we have to stick with Bustos because I'm not sure even on the show if we mentioned this, but we were kind of waiting for, for Bustos to take the game, one game, by the scruff of the neck. And I think this was really his first sort of proper um, proper performance in that regard. I mean, he, he's going he's gonna to get double teamed every game and it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And then to have, and to have, like you mentioned, you know, Caden Chung overlapping. He, uh, I talked to Bustos about this today. You know, he still says that Caden Chung is the most underrated player in the CPL still. And that's high praise coming from a player that he's, he's playing behind. And, you know, it was funny just sort of watching him obviously perform to, to the level he did at IG field. And you think about, you know, how, how important Caden Chung is to his game, considering, you know, at Valor, he was impressive, but, you know, he didn't really have that kind of, that kind of that, that duo. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, Bustos was incredible. Obviously, the goal, I'm sure people listening to this have already seen it, but um, that was really the difference at the end of the day, right? If, if that if they don't get that in, then, you know, there were a couple of chances waning from, from Taron Campbell and the like. But So let's get into this quickly because I think we, it, it's a really good topic. How do you stop them? So how, how, yeah, how, do, no, you stop, yeah. how do you stop Chung and Bustos? Because Atletico Ottawa had a plan. Now, for those who didn't see it, they basically played a 4-4-1-1 with Manella as the one uh, and then McKendry in midfield uh, with Viti Martinez. And they asked Nunez to play this left midfield role with Neufeld. And Nunez looks like a player that could be very dangerous going forward. He also looks like the kind of typical player who loves to play wider in a 4-3-3 and not really be asked to do any kind of defensive work. And that's what he was able to do. He got burned a number of yeah. times by Chung. And then as soon as Chung gets the ball and goes one-on-one with Nouvelle, who stretches the field, the space is inside for Bustos to go and operate. So how do you stop them? Because I think teams coming into playing them have got to work this out. Now, the only team that really did kind of stop them a little bit, well, two, York didn't did a little bit because Chung didn't play that way. He played on the left-hand mm-hmm. side in that game. And Forge and We'll get we'll get to that. Maybe that's a bit of a, yeah. an opportunity here to bring you in, Charlie, because Owua was named mm-hmm. by Bobby Smyniotis tonight as the best player so far for Forge. He on the left side was terrific again in that game. But is it it's gonna be very difficult for left backs like him to do this job on their own without getting the work from everybody else, isn't it? No matter what system you play. Yeah, it is. I mean that that Pacific Forge game is a really fascinating one because I I think I'd actually be fairly confident in saying that Kwame Awu and Caden Chung might be the two best fullbacks in this league at the moment. And just to see that battle going down is is really something that should be appointment viewing, I think, when these two teams play. But it is really overwhelming, I think, just, just to see the way that Chung and Bustos are just so in sync all the time. I mean, they've known each other for a while. They've been playing with each other at several levels of the game. I think even before they, they've linked back up at Pacific... But I mean, Chung is Chung is just so comfortable on the ball. He's just so happy to do that overlap and cover that space for Bustos, who just will sometimes get that ball in that same sort of half space, you know, ten yards outside of the box, and just stand there. He'll just <laughs> he'll just stop with the ball, and he'll know exactly where Chung is behind him. Right? He'll that just... is somehow one of the most exciting parts of Pacific's game is seeing Marco Bustos standing. It's one of the, it's one happen. of those moments that happens, you know, maybe once a game at least with this team, where you just see Bustos kind of take that stance, and he's you he's not looking back on purpose, right? Because if he looks back, then he kind of gives it away a little bit. But he just kind of taps it behind him, and and Chung's immediately there, and Bustos bursts in the box, and then that that cross is almost always going to be you know, very, very dangerous for somebody to get ahead on. And I, I really don't know necessarily how you stop it without pulling too many players out of position. Right. Because yeah. I think I right. think maybe the only way to do it at that point would be to really, really pressure them and, and run at them hard on that corner. But, you know, Marco Bustos has incredible vision 
at this sport. So if you do have a center back run him down and there's nobody behind you, then he might put it through your legs and, you know, Taryn Campbell's probably there for it. I, I want to preface the next point by saying that I understand that there's nobody in Canadian soccer who is anywhere like Lionel Messi. <laughs> I just want to make that, I just want to make sure that I say that before I get to my next point. But when Bustos picked up that ball and drove the way that he did towards the penalty box, but on a, you know on a, a, this wonderful wizardry run with technique, and then cutting inside and then slotting the ball through the legs, you know, of Kapoor to allow someone, it it was very Messi esque. You know, it was. It just was. And, you know, that's the kind of, you know, he's got that stature anyway, right? He's, he's quite small. He keeps the ball quite low, low, low center of gravity. I actually made him blush post-match. I didn't mean to. He I loved asked, that. <laughs> <laughs> I said it. So he kind of got a little bit, uh, a little bit blushy. Uh, but, Benedict, help me out here. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, definitely. He's uh, one of the best players in this league, I think, at sort of taking a game and is under his own control and sort of dictating everything that happens in the game and, and do it back to the the only way to help him really is they try to do that, and they kind of got burned a little bit. But I think that's better than trying to pull players out of position, like Charlie mentioned, and, and just getting burned by Caden Chung instead. It's, it's just just got to bring him down and <laughs> hope for the best. I, you know, sorry about Charlie. I I think maybe the most impressive thing to me about about just specifically that assist, that goal from Bustos's perspective is, I mean, you you just mentioned his post match press conference excuse me, press conference, usually when a player is asked after a game, you know, walk me through that goal. Tell me about that goal. It's a terrible answer. It's really boring. You know, they'll, they'll say some kind of cliche about, you know, taking your chances and they'll just give a quick shout out to whoever made the, made the pass to them. Bustos really walked us through this goal and he kind of got us into his head a little bit about, you know, he could see this defender backing off and he could see where the runs were happening around him and he didn't like any of the options. Then he says, yeah, the more that opened up, it looked like the only option was to go through his legs. So I had to try it, and it turned out it worked. <laughs> and I was just so impressed with, first of all, that he would explain it in that much detail to us. And second of all, for just him to have that strong a vision of how everything on the pitch is happening around him. I mean, he wore the armband in this game, I think, for, for the first time to start a match for Pacific. And he really was, you know, just this team's leader in, in knowing just what was going on the whole game. Charlie, I think that's an exceptional point. And I'll add to this is that I'm not saying that those who don't describe it well can't. <laughs> but, 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 what, but I think what your point is, is I think, first of all, it shows the maturation process of Bustos on and off the pitch. But I also think, again, this is the level of thinking and his recall and ability that is making him a better player. Yeah. Is that decision making and then to be able to have that high level of conversations for, with us is the same things he's having internally, Marty, in his own mind to help him do this. Yeah, the the amount, <laughs> yeah, the, the amount of recall on that that answer was crazy. I can't remember what I did yesterday. Maybe that's just the <laughs> maybe that's just the bubble. But <laughs> oh, no, it's no. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a special player. He's a special player in Canadian soccer. Full yeah. stop. Yeah, he's no a special doubt. player that that we. I mean, that we don't. We don't have very many of very many of we don't have very many messy like players. So it's no, worth it's, noting. It, it, it is, and we'll keep continue to talk about it because I think he's been exceptional so far. Um, a word on Ottawa: they were a team all of us I think were high on coming in uh, in our preseason thoughts and I ideas. A team that spent a lot of time and money in preseason, uh, spending time in Spain uh, to prepare for this. A team we expected to come out and deliver quickly. A team that did, although in a very even game against FC Edmonton with a moment of magic from Vitti Martinez as the difference maker. A team then that got, quite frankly, battered by Cavalry and scored one goal on a counter that was a beautiful goal, but really, we're never really in the game. Let's be honest, guys. Like, And then lost again comprehensively and then lost again here, I think, comprehensively. So for me, that's three games in a row. You could see Mr. After the Game knew it's time for answers here. Like it's 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 been a difficult time, and suddenly they've gone from being a team that everybody was kind of on to suddenly being a team. That, this is this is not good right now, Marty. This is concerning. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know exactly where you all want to start, but like for me, it's just you know it's just going forward. Malcolm Shaw was on an island uh, yesterday. It breaks down, doesn't it? Every time they get in the final third. Yeah, and like and and that's the thing. I I've actually quite liked. Malcolm in this tournament, all things considered, considering, you know, you know, what 
his circumstances are. Chris Manella, I know you, you kind of touched on it there, playing as like essentially, you know, an attacking midfielder. Um, that's not his position. That's not that's not the kind of player he is, and I'm sure he would tell you that too. I mean, it's 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 just like it just seems like it's making do at this point. Like we we've talked a lot about Soto coming into this team and maybe changing things, um, but I mean, what do you all think? Like maybe over time, hopefully things in the attacking third start to shape up, or do, do we need like I mean, having an Acuna would be nice, <laughs> but a player like Acuna would would also help, right? Yeah, I think, and I wrote this after the game. I think all of their positives are without the ball you know yeah poor oh, yeah. Mecky yeah. looked pretty good okay Acosta looks like a decent player although he's not played a lot of right back in the shift in Ferdinand looks like a real good defender but really struggles in possession to play out and particularly when he's pressed and that's why I think one of the reasons why he got took off at half time I thought McKenzie was outstanding in the game yeah. uh, but all of these pluses are fine but as Drew Becky told us after the game Charlie things have got to change in certain areas and he didn't pointed out but we all know where <laughs> you know we yeah. haven't seen anything from Nunez Soto there was a problem with the paperwork apparently and we all hopefully he's going to come pretty quickly Telfer's not coming anytime soon he's at the gold cup um but this is mm -hmm. a team that's going to have to turn it around pretty quickly in the attacking third Charlie yeah they are uh, I and I'm not necessarily sure where exactly it comes from I mean they've gone with this sort of single striker setup I think in every game and it hasn't necessarily yielded what you would hope it to uh, they are as i mean christian as you mentioned they are playing quite well defensively and, and when they don't have the ball but i might also say that they're not necessarily going looking for the ball as much as maybe they should mm -hmm. and i can't yeah. remember if it was if it was drew becky or, or mista that pointed this out but they're they're not necessarily putting as much pressure on the ball as i think at times in this league you need to to be able to get a little bit more of a stake in a game and to be able to you know, put your put your stamp on it because they are, you know, inviting a little bit of pressure and defending very, very well. We we you know we have to have to say over and over again, they are doing well in those areas, but not necessarily, you know, taking initiative in, in terms of hunting teams down. And I think it I think it was something that Mista brought up is he just wants them to be a little bit more aggressive. Benedict, your thoughts on Ottawa? Yeah, I think they're really missing Ryan Telfer, especially. I think he, you know, he's a difference maker in this league, and he's gonna be the rest of the bubble, I assume. And, and uh, that, that's definitely a player they could they could use to sort of link not only score goals, but also sort of link the attack and the defense. I think that's something that's been missing going forward is the ball either gets sort of hoofed down the field or or they, they lose the ball somewhere in, in midfield. Yeah, stretch the back line. I totally mm -hmm. agree with you. It's kind of all kind of too safe at the moment uh, as well in the in that area. So. Yeah, interesting stuff. Okay, um, I know we didn't have a chance to chat about this. Usually we do before the show, but we've been rushing. Kyle Becker won Player of the Week, by the way. And that's <laughs> that's. I know it, nobody really said otherwise, yeah. right? You, yeah. You're all good with that, right? That, oh yeah, we've oh, all yeah. decided Kyle Becker. Won. We, we usually we come together and announce it, but at this point, you know, Marty's driving people home. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> you know, ben, Benedict's playing, you know, Frank Skinner and David Badil and. <laughs> Charlie's, okay. writing, Charlie's writing his match report. So we've all been busy, you know? They they played three Lions four times in the stadium tonight. Did they? I kid you not. I kid you what? not. Yep. Twice in, twice in pregame, one at halftime, and then one at full time. DJ not Rob term. Gale. Yeah. Is that is that is that Tommy Wheel Jr. trying to get in Marco Carducci's head? <laughs> yeah, it might be. Yeah, I'm cu I'm curious if I'm curious who maybe requests. Maybe Gail walked up there and Are you guys maybe. all gonna have like a watch party for the Euro final, Marty, in the bubble? Yeah, we we're just sort of talking about that now. You know, we're there are a couple teams that we want to target and and sort of targets maybe the you know the wrong word, but um, you know Halifax for example. There's a couple players like you know Alessandro Rigi, uh, Pelusi, cool. uh, and then he's also gonna have like Corey Bent's gonna be in the same room. So we're gonna mm -hmm. go check them out. There's gonna be a couple teams that we're gonna be able to go uh, spy on, see if there's any scraps that break out. <laughs> really, we'll well, tune in for Monday's episode for <laughs> stories from the bubble and scraps after the Euro final. <laughs> Final when England beat how it ends. Italy uh, in the final. <laughs> uh, all right, time for our rapid fire questions of the week. Uh, which Cal Becker goal was the best, the volley or top bins, Charlie? The volley, I think. The that's volley. a that's a gorgeous touch. You like and, and, and as I said, I, I just love how he manages to get into that space in the in the beginning. I like yeah, I liked your analysis on that, Benedict. I agree. Just the movement on that play to sort of turn Jody Char inside that was just was really nicely done. 
Yeah, I think Joe will want that one back, no doubt. Uh, maybe would have tracked the run, maybe if it was a little bit later in the year. Uh, mm -hmm. Marty. Maybe top bins just to make it interesting. <laughs> I thought it, I thought it was a wicked hit, man. It yeah, was. It wow. really was. I'm gonna go all in with the tie top bins as well. What a strike that was! So the volley was nice. Yes. Yeah. yeah so we, Brady Brady can break the tie when he listens to the show tomorrow or the next day, whatever wherever whatever time zone he's in. Uh, the player whose stock rose high this week for you. Uh, in terms of obviously, you can take this any way you want. You may have been thought they were doing really well anyway, but player whose stock rose high, Marty. I'm gonna have to say Isaiah Johnson for for York United. We really didn't touch on Mike Petrasso. Also, is a good, good pick job. for this, but yep. um, like led his team. I think it passes and touches and had a great diagonal that led to that Lowell goal. I thought he's just been fantastic. And again, he, you know, he only played 18 minutes for York last year, and to come out and be this established in the midfield, I think is a is a is a big accomplishment. Charlie. Uh, we haven't mentioned him, I don't think, but Matteo Polisi for Pacific. Mm. Yes. I think it was yep. his first professional start. And he yes, comes in, he he's immediately, you know, one of the kind of main outlets for Pacific going forward and in midfield. I, th I was just so impressed with with his maturity and his ability to to get forward. Good one. Uh, Benedict? Um, I'm not going to say Declan Rice, but uh, I'll, say, I'll say Max <laughs> Ferrari. Um, he, was, he was great on the right-hand side for, for uh, York, and he was just, just dangerous, as he's been all season. I like that pick. We might actually be the only soccer podcast in the world that isn't debating the Raheem Sterling dive. Uh, moving <laughs> it's on. because it's not worth debating. Never, never. Hey, no, we're not debating it. Uh, we're, we're not. Moving on. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll take uh, McNaughton, Lucas McNaughton, who again on the Pacific I thought was terrific again. And it's really starting to be a dominate, a dominant center back in that position. And I know Atletico Ottawa weren't great, but uh, player this week you want more from on the opposite end of the steam. Who do you want to see more from? Charlie, uh, mostly because we know how talented he is, but Chris Manella, okay, I think, he, yeah, he's he's and we know what kind of player he is. He's very good. He's got a lot of experience. Not necessarily getting on the ball as much as as he might want, and maybe not necessarily the creative force that that Ottawa wants him to be at the moment. Benedict, I think we might have lost Benedict. Maybe he's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's put his England flag up again behind. We'll see better us back, Marty. I'll, I'll have to remove him. Did it? Maybe his internet expired at, at midnight or something. Maybe we <laughs> maybe just lost it. Him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Anthony Novak. Anthony Novak. I want. Yeah. I wanted him to score a goal goal early, and I thought yeah. tonight was yeah. maybe his night, and just didn't get it. He had know? a big smile on his face. Did you see when he was walking yes. out? He was all ready, mm -hmm. and then substituted. Didn't necessarily go his way. Benedict's back. You didn't miss anything, mate. Uh, player who you want to see more from? That you, a little bit disappointing so far. Uh, I think Taron Campbell has been getting into good areas, but maybe he needs to finish a couple more chances. But uh, he, he has been good. But I think he can be another level better. That's fair. I got a lot of time yeah. for Campbell. It was taken off at mm -hmm. half time. I think more to come. I'm gonna say Nunez, Rafa Nunez from yeah. Ottawa as well. I just, had him down, yeah. He hasn't just just not delivering at the moment. And I don't think they're playing to his strengths either. So I, like all of these, it's not a, never easy. All right, the games to come uh, this weekend: Halifax against FC Edmonton, Pacific against York United, Valor versus Forge, Cavalry versus Atletico Ottawa. Game you're looking forward to the most this weekend, Benedict. I'm going to say the uh, Noah Verhoeven derby and say uh, Pacific and York. <laughs> nice. Marty? I, 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 I have the same, but I'm gonna, it's the Trust the Kids derby. Pacific mm -hmm. Trust the, the Kids in the derby. first year, and now it's York United's turn. The Noah Verhoeven Trust the Kids derby. It's going to be one of those <laughs> massive, like, like a NASCAR race that has those ridiculous sponsors, and you, you don't even know where it's from anymore. Uh, <laughs> Charlie, what about you? Uh, yeah, that's a really good shout, but I think I'll give some love to Halifax and Edmonton. Just nice. because they've both had the week off, yes. and it'll be really interesting to see if that makes a difference, especially from the start of this game. That's a good shout as well. I'll take Valor Forge and see what's going to happen with, yeah. uh, with that one. That's going to be a terrific one as well. All right. A reminder, you can go to our very own predictor presented by Come On. You can go on there. You can win prizes, and you can actually get a trip all the way to the final at the end of this year. Uh, so in the spirit of that, we'll end our show picking one game each to predict. It might help you randomly. Let's go with who am I going to give? Uh, Halifax FC Edmonton. I'll take it. I'll, I'm going to take that one at a 2-2 draw, uh, inspired oh. by Charlie letting these players off this week, come out and explode. Halifax finally get their first goals, but Edmonton have looked pretty resolute, so I'll take 2-2. Uh, Pacific York United, who wants that one? Pacific York United, go with Marty. Scoreline? Uh, I'm going to say 3-2 Pacific. 
three. I, I, th- I think I think there's some goals in this one. All the goals long. coming in. There we yeah. go. Uh, Vala Forge Benedict. Uh, I'd say Forge are going to keep it hard. I think uh, two one. Charlie, you get the last word, my friend. Cavalry Atletico Ottawa. Oh, I'm sorry, Mister. Three one Cavalry. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think too many people will be changing that on the predictor. I think they'll be going behind you as well, uh, boys. It's after midnight where we are. It isn't after midnight where Marty is, but he's got a package to go pick up. So we better leave. <laughs> Thanks for everybody for listening again. A reminder: those games will be exciting this weekend. We'll be back on Monday to review them and more content coming on daily at campl.ca and Canada. That's right, the men's team Canada are back. The Gold Cup is back. Martinique on Sunday. We'll recap that for you as well on Monday live on One Soccer as all the Canadian Premier League games are as well. Thank you for listening and have a good week.